Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'd like to say it's a privilege to be here, uh, to be honoured with the award, and for us to be able to present uh, our project to you guys. Um, I'd like to start off first by acknowledging uh, uh, someone who is very special to us, uh, Jan Hosta, the uh, uh, president of uh, Big Dutchman Agriculture Asia. If you can just give a warm welcome to him. Okay, um, he, he's been representing our client, um, and I think Datum is a wonderful forum for us to actually open up uh, architectural discourse uh, to the public, and this is a wonderful way of doing it. Okay. Uh, so let me start by talking about Big Dutchman itself. Uh, Big Dutchman started in 1938 uh, as a family-owned business uh, in the business of producing animal husbandry equipment. Um, and it has uh, now spread to about 120 countries and that's where it's operating. Um, Big Dutchman comes from a little town called Kelvis Lash. It's about 200 uh, kilometers from Hamburg. And it's set in a rural area. It's agricultural, uh, in spite of the fact that it's industrial. Uh, and if you look at how they have actually uh, set up their businesses, uh, it's very low key, uh, very human scale in approach. And uh, they always see themselves as being part of the community uh, at Calvus Large, and that's the fundamentals of building their businesses. Uh, but it belies the fact that it's a huge warehouse operation and business. So what it does is that it actually coexists uh, as a large operation, but in a very environmentally friendly way. Um, and then coming from Calvus Large, in Germany uh, to Bukit Raja, uh, the first things that uh, you notice from this satellite image is the fact that there are many, many bald patches. Okay? And that's where our site is. And what a shocker, an environmental shocker. You see denigration of the local lands. Uh, really, it's all been scourged, the hills are eroded. Um, and then our site, everything has been engineered. The road, the slopes, the green, the water, everything, everything that you can see. And I think in some ways it's taken away a lot of the character of what lies there before. So it's, it's almost amounting to uh, an environmental genocide from our opinion. Um, so what do we do? We cannot reinstate the land. We cannot put back what was there before. We can only start a process of healing. And uh, how do you heal a land like that? Um, one of the things that we've done is to actually draw from where Big Dutchmen come from. So there are two things that they do. One is they respond to where they are based. In, in the environment, in the climate, and I think the other one is also in the contextual roots of where they came from. So just to give you an idea, um, our site, which is about 20 acres, it lies in the north-south uh, axis, um, and uh, the disadvantage that we have is that the long sides of the buildings actually faces uh, the morning sun and the afternoon sun, and they gain heat on either side, but the harshest one is actually in the afternoon. Um, but the big advantage, obviously, is that uh, we've got the prevailing winds, uh, which faces the long side, so we are able to capitalize on, on that prevailing wind. So half the year is from the northeast, and the other half is from the southeast. So I think responding climatically uh, by recognizing what is there on site uh, sets the impetus, sets the stage for us then to uh, develop our designs. Um, and uh, when you look further beyond, 
uh, really the lands are pretty minimal in terms of the vegetation uh, and all that is around it. Um, principally, we've got two buildings on site. The first one is, is the head office to the north um, and uh, the warehouse is actually to the south. Uh, the back of the site uh, is basically a reservoir at the top of the hill um, and the slopes, as I said earlier, is, has been engineered. Um, so we've got slightly different responses to the two buildings. Uh, the head office, uh, which is principally office spaces, um, we've essentially lifted it up a floor and then allowed for the ventilation to come through uh, below uh, to the back. And then uh, where, where it's hot, we've essentially given it a wrap so that uh, it's protected from the sun. Um, for the warehouse itself, uh, it's a naturally ventilated space, so uh, what we've decided to do is to actually capitalize on the prevailing winds, and that is to essentially funnel as much of the air as possible into the building so that you are able to uh, create a comfortable space and allow the hot air to get out on top. Very, very simple. Second thing uh, is contextualizing uh, the roots of Big Dutchman, uh, and that is choosing the choice of brick. Uh, where they come from, Northeast Germany, uh, brick is a utilitarian material. Um, they use it all over the place. Uh, something that they're familiar with. Uh, it's quite warm to them. Um, and also it's industrial in nature, the humble brick. Um, but from that utilitarian material, uh, it's been used for expressions, architectural expressions. Uh, it's been done in the past and it's done in the present. Uh, some of these are lovely, delightful architectural expressions. So then uh, we took that and says, hey, can we apply it in the local context, in the tropical context? Um, so what do we do? The brick actually is a good insulator. So in Europe, the, the brick keeps the heat in. In the tropics, it keeps the heat out. In Europe, the apertures are large to allow for direct sun to come in. Uh, but in the tropics, you keep it narrow to keep the direct sun down for indirect lighting. Um, it's a wonderful material, it ages very well um, and is almost evergreen and there's a lot of character in, in that material. Um, and uh, we've also carried through some of the detailing, uh, the traditional detailing uh, from uh, this material. Um, as we explore into the various types of details, here we've tried the different types of brick bonds uh, with the cobbling, um, and uh, here uh, is a, a, the Mont Blanc uh, bond for the double walls, um, and uh, this one we've tried it with the stretcher bond uh, with the cobbles to form the details, um, and we actually had German bricklayers who came over to share with our local brick layers in terms of uh, their experiences on, on the brick itself. Uh, and then we took that application and took it up to produce the frieze at the top of the buildings. Uh, and we played with the, the frieze so that you, you've got a more vertical one and then you've got the little ones that punctuates uh, the rhythm of the, the elevation. Uh, here are some more. Uh, We've looked at the sills, we've looked at the headers, and we took the stringers through so that you actually align the windows and the cobbles uh, together with the rest of the fenestration. Um, our client, he, he's, he's an architectural enthusiast, and uh, he's, he's very facetious about uh, the brick. Um, so what we did was we, we traveled the entire Klang Valley 
looking at different buildings, different brick walls, just to look at, uh, looking for the particular uh, brick that, that he wanted. Um, and after all that travel, he wasn't happy. He didn't, he, he thinks it's just simply not good enough. Um, we felt, we felt that, like we were looking for Cinderella. It's, it's, you know, we, we, we went to talk to different manufacturers and finally uh, we were able to find the brick that he wanted, uh, which is the one on the right. Uh, this is an overburned brick or a clinker brick. Um, and the rest of the bricks on the left, uh, it looks a little bit uh, under fired. Uh, and some of it were too even in tone. Um, so it really didn't fit uh, what, in his mind, uh, a brick should be. So really, that overburned brick is, is a very, very nice character brick. Uh, so we've took that brick and we've applied it on the elevations, especially the ones that are facing the sun, both uh, east and west. Uh, and here, uh, in the final application, uh, the, we followed the grids and the proportions uh, so that uh, we picked up the traditional uh, brick detailing. Uh, and uh, also we've layered the brick so that uh, the landscape could interface with the buildings that eventually when the trees grows up, it actually shades uh, the big apertures that we have uh, for the views on the ground floor. Uh, and as we go further along, uh, the bricks are used to anchor and shoulder the main entrance areas uh, to make a formal announcement into the building. Uh, and as we move again uh, to the elevation beyond, uh, essentially it is uh, taking the freeze and taking the proportion and rhythm uh, through, but we've played with each of the rhythms so that uh, there's a variation in terms of the, the type of detailing that we have. Uh, this is also for in preparation for the phase two of this building, uh, which will eventually come. Um, so we've done everything traditional that we could, and the next question that we ask ourselves is, uh, we like a little bit of irony and contradiction in uh, the work, so can we make brick float? Here it is, 150 meters length of wall, six meters high, and we've lifted up three meters in the air, and it's projected away from the facade by about a meter. Uh, no, it's not just a whimsical thing. Uh, it's something that we do for the fun of it, or the heck of it, uh, but it's got a practical side. Uh, by lifting that wall out, uh, it has given us the opportunity to uh, funnel as much of the natural air into the building as possible to create the cross ventilation across a big space. So really, it is cross ventilation on a grand scale. Um, and uh, if you look at that floating wall, for us it's a wind catcher. It brings in the air from the bottom and from the top, okay, without water intrusion. Um, and internally, uh, it's airy and it's bright. Um, and I think we have created uh, quite a comfortable environment. Um, and as we move up to the roof, uh, we have introduced uh, the photovoltaic cells. Uh, we have got solar power on the roof uh, by taking energy from the sun. Um, and what it does is that it provides a third of the consumption that Big Dutchman uh, uses each month. Uh, and uh, it's about 40,000 kilowatt hours per month in terms of energy. Uh, so taking the cue from that floating theme, uh, we felt we wanted to keep that lightness in, in the architecture that we've created. So we've uh, introduced it also into the office building. Um, and uh, we've created an illusion that the, the roof actually floats above the wall. Uh, and functionally, it actually allows for light to, to enter the building at the top floors without having to have a second screen. Um, and uh, the, the brick really provides a plinth uh, for, for the design. Okay, uh, and from a detail point of view, we've essentially cantilevered 
uh, from the inside uh, to give it the support. Um, so at the entrances, uh, this, this idea of that floating roof is taken uh, further, uh, deeper, so that uh, you actually create quite, quite a large overhang uh, and there are some very comfortable spaces, especially up in the uh, boardroom uh, where you get a total view without any uh, obstruction at all. Um, here you are, uh, it shows the amount of shading that we have. Uh, so it actually creates quite a nice space uh, up in, in those areas. Um, so when we go to the east of the building, <coughs> uh, we've got a wonderful view to the back of the site, uh, or as wonderful as it can be, uh, where it's green. Uh, and uh, we've lifted the building, as I've said earlier, that, that we provide the ventilation below. But what it also does is that it allows us to align the landscape to the rear side where the slopes are so that it looks like it's seamless. But there's actually a big gap between our building and the engineered slope at the back. Uh, this gave us an opportunity to open up the windows uh, to uh, the views. Uh, and uh, essentially, the entire east elevation has been opened up so that you can actually enjoy uh, the, the landscape area. Uh, and doing so, uh, we have to be careful of the eastern sun. So this is where we've uh, introduced the operable louvers. And these are motorized sun sensor louvers so that it actually tracks the sun uh, as, as the day goes on. Uh, very simply, uh, the, the louvers are mounted on a cantilevered support. Uh, and uh, we've got a maintenance platform at the back of it for servicing. Um, as you look in, into the building, as you go into the building, uh, the uh, louvers are perforated so that we don't obstruct the views to, to uh, eliminate any of the blind spots. Uh, and really, you can enjoy the entire uh, landscape area, which is really the private side of the, the, the scheme. Um, when we enter the building, uh, the material connection goes inside together uh, as part of the architecture uh, and uh, really the warmth of the brick comes in but is applied in a softer uh, and cozier manner. Um, the ground floor effectively is the public space uh, where it serves the customers, the staff and uh, to the back of it is the show gallery area where they demonstrate their materials, but always having the landscape uh, being open to us all the time. Uh, and the cafeteria pro provided uh, are for the staff and visitors as well, so that you don't actually have to travel out uh, to have your meals. Uh, and in doing so, hopefully, we'll reduce uh, some of the time that you need. Oh, sorry. OK, uh, I need to hurry up. Uh, the upper floors, uh, the connection to the staff, uh, it is part of the idea of not compartmentalizing people, but continue to uh, open up uh, spaces so that people connect. Um, and right at the very top is the uh, cholesterol windows where the corporate offices are. Brings in air, brings in light. So when we look at the, the scheme as a whole, uh, we are hoping that eventually the landscape will grow and uh, the buildings will retreat into an oasis of greeneries. Uh, but we are always reminded that we are in Bukit Raja when we look over the horizon. So change is, that's the theme of the conference today. Uh, we ask ourselves what we have done to effect change. Um, three things I want to take away with you, for you guys. One is uh, the consciousness, our consciousness drives the environment. Um, very often, uh, it's very fashionable for us to do envi uh, greens, uh, but a lot of the times we do it because of benchmarking uh, and compliances. Uh, and a lot of the times, when you look at it, uh, nobody goes out to scar lands, but because we are driven by efficiency and other things, sometimes we miss the mark of why we are doing it. Uh, so we don't want to be boxed in, and. Uh, we want to be able to, to explore and look at a wider picture. So some of the things that we are looking at are the, really using what is naturally there so that you are able to uh, capitalize on it. 
the local environment. All right. Uh, some of our other work, uh, we want to capitalize on the natural environment uh, and place making that uh, you do not uh, consume the energies but capitalize on it. Uh, we like to work with the young so that uh, you build on the new generation, the next generation. Uh, we play with what the trees are, we mimic it and uh, we wind funnel in some of them. Uh, second skin. Uh, we like to interplay and explore the second skin, so sometimes it's for function and it's uh, an interplay with the architecture and expressions that, that we like to achieve. Uh, staircase design matters, I think. Uh, it's important to uh, let people walk and I think people generally do enjoy walking uh, and in Big Dutchman um, the stairs are made friendly so that you are able to actually do uh, the journey uh, as you enter the building and even the fire staircases are not treated as a utilitarian space it is actually part and parcel of that healthy pursuit uh, of exercise I think we simply do not have enough exercise and, it, and it's a fact um, so if you are able to encourage people by having properly designed staircases friendly uh, they see that journey uh, as a continuous one and uh, we believe that there is a direct relationship between health and environment uh, but you don't score very many points for that um, a second point I want to make is uh, the brick by brick metaphor for architects is about timelessness, it's about the material and it's about everything that the, the material is but I think for Big Dutchman there's a deeper relevance uh, human relevance. Um, Big Dutchman has been in Malaysia for 25 years and it's been building person by person, customer by customer before they started on this project um, and uh, when that happens, they start to bridge and link people and that's reflected in the way that we've designed the building uh, and staff to staff, customers to staff, management to staff. A brick at a time and eventually the whole world is connected. Uh, the third one, point that we want to make, um, our client belief system when the client belief system and the architectural philosophy are unified as one, it is inextricably bound so that there's a value and meaning in the design and that it goes beyond uh, merely the physical one. Okay. Uh, I'd like to leave you guys with these images uh, as we take you from the morning to the night. Uh, we found a lot of delight, a lot of warmth, uh, and a lot of satisfaction uh, in the process. Um, the difficult journey is that uh, in many places that you go, we see designs uh, which are well presented, but when you look behind the facade, it is actually empty and it's, there's a lot of nothingness. Um, so it is our conviction that the three are prerequisites to essentially creating a soul in architecture. Thank you for listening. God bless you all.